welcome back to Series Regular, the Hollywood Reporter's all-in podcast on genre television. Hello, everybody. I am Josh Wiggler, and today it's straight on into the zombie apocalypse. Yes, that's right. Walking Dead season is upon us once again. Although, of course, for many of you, Walking Dead season never really went away. Fear the Walking Dead season five was airing all summer long. It has freshly wrapped up with a highly controversial ending that I dare not spoil here on this podcast. Though I will say if you'd like to catch up and if you'd like to hear some insight from showrunners Andrew Chambliss and Ian Goldberg, you can head to THR.com where we have a postmortem with the Fear the Walking Dead showrunners. But this podcast isn't about Fear the Walking Dead. This podcast is about The Walking Dead, which returns on October 6th with its 10th season premiere. That's right, 10 seasons of The Walking Dead on television. Season 10 marks the first full season of The Walking Dead without Andrew Lincoln as Rick Grimes. It also marks the departure of another veteran actor from the franchise. Denai Guerrera will be stepping away as Michonne as of season 10. We do not know the details. We do not know the circumstances. We only know the inevitability. This is the final season for the sword-swinging Michonne, which means that we will be left with just Norman Reedus as Daryl Dixon and Melissa McBride as Carol Pelletier as the veterans from the first three seasons of The Walking Dead still on the show. But this is a show that is used to change. This is a show where the M.O. is the sudden departures of major, major characters. Nothing new for The Walking Dead. Business as usual. But business has changed in the last couple of seasons with a change at the top. Angela Kang, who's been a longtime writer on The Walking Dead, has served as showrunner of The Walking Dead since season nine. In season nine, several time jumps occurred. The action moved almost a full decade into the future. The Alexandria safe zone is something akin to an actual civilization at this point. And of course, as everybody is starting to feel comfortable with their new post-apocalyptic lives... In Walk the Whisperers, a group of feral survivors who are more comfortable with the dead than they are with the living. Samantha Morton plays Alpha, the queen of the Whisperers, and she made herself known in very loud fashion toward the end of season nine when she and her allies abducted several members of the Alexandria safe zone, killed them, decapitated them, and placed their severed heads on a series of spikes to mark a border between the Alexandrians and the Whisperers. It was traumatic, to say the least, and that trauma will follow into Season 10 as we get into the full-blown Whisperer War, a celebrated arc from Robert Kirkman and Charlie Adlard's Walking Dead comic books on which the show is based. Of course, those comic books no longer exist, or at least are no longer currently being published, thanks to Kirkman suddenly ending the Walking Dead comic book over the summer with a gigantic-sized, unannounced series finale. Does that mean that we are getting close to the end of the Walking Dead television series as well? Are we close to the end of the line? Will it be 10 seasons and that's it, or 10 seasons and just a little bit further? Much like The Whisperers, nobody's really talking on that point. But I still asked the question when I spoke with Angela Kang for this week's series regular. In the following interview, we are talking about all things season 10. From a spoiler-free perspective, of course, as we wouldn't want to tip away anything that actively happens in the season 10 premiere. But if you're excited for The Walking Dead's return and you want to know what you're getting into when season 10 arrives on October 6th, or if you're a lapsed viewer and you're thinking about getting back into the game, this is the interview for you. Without further ado, let's turn it over to my conversation with Angela. But first, maybe to ease us in, how about a few noises from the dead? We're bonded together by the fellowship of the living. The future is ours. So long as we hold on to our faith in one another. We help one another. And defend one another. We can be safe. We stand together for life, not death, in this new world. We survived, but this is about more than survival. We're making the world new again. 
together we survive. And together we thrive. Together, we silence the whispers. Hi, Angela. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hi, Josh. Thanks. Glad to be here. All right. So we are we are very close to Walking Dead season 10 premiering for the for the viewing masses at large. How are you feeling uh, so close to the world finding out what you've been working on all these months? I am feeling excited to share what we've been working on. Um, I think you know, I came onto the staff in season two, so that was seven episodes in. And I, you know, I I don't think any of us back then thought that the show could go for 10 years. We all just knew that we loved it so, so much. So to be here is is really humbling and great. And then I'm also nervous and I want people to, to like what we've been doing. I hope people love it as much as we do. But, um, you know, so it's 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 just the mix. It's a swirl of emotion, Josh. So it's your it's your second year as showrunner heading into season 10. Does that help cool your nerves at all? You know that people responded really positively to season nine. You have a full season under your belt as showrunner heading into season 10. How does that impact you creatively? You know, it, it helps that I, I know that I did the job for a year and didn't set the house completely on fire like that. That's nice. But I also think, you know, it's like my personality and the personality of my writers is like we we never want to rest on our laurels. And so we're always just like, how can we, you know, continue to entertain people? What's like new stuff we can do? And, you know, it's I think if if I ever get to a point where I'm coasting, then that's then that's bad. But also that just might not be me. I'll be, I've been taken over by body snatchers. So, yeah, I don't know. That's season 11 material. That, exactly. Totally. The body snatchers are coming late in Walking Dead for those who haven't read the comic books. Yep. <laughs> so looking at the story of season 10, when did you start thinking about what you wanted to do? I mean, the Whisperer War is clearly a major arc from the comic book. And there's a great tradition of the, the remix approach from the comic book to the TV show. So even if you have a blueprint of some story to follow from the comics, the, the show itself has drastically transformed in, into its own entity. For you, knowing what was there in the source material from Robert Kirkman and Charlie Adler to, to lift from, when did you start thinking about how you wanted to adapt some of that material and how to start framing that out for season 10? Was that as early as, you know, early season nine? Was it something that you started thinking about towards the end of season nine? I would just love to know a little more about your process with that. Yeah, I think, you know, knowing that this storyline was coming up and knowing that I was going to be running the show during this stretch, I think there was some thought some very, very early thought going into it, even as far back as like season eight, when when Scott Gimple kind of had said like, hey, like, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to transition into this other job and, you know, want you to take over the show. But, you know, at that point, it's all so theoretical, you know, like until you kind of get in there and know who you've cast and and how you, you know, where storylines are going to go and how they play out, it's you know, there, there's no way to completely plan it out, but there were just certain things that I'd been thinking about, like at least in the back of my mind for a while. When we really got into season nine, that's when, you know, even as we were working on season nine, there was some sense of like, okay, here are some things in season 10 that we know we want to hit and maybe, and here are some things that we want to find twists on. So we started kind of setting up these stories. Um, you know, I would say like one example of a story that we really knew that we wanted to tell was we knew we wanted to tell a big Negan story. And so the way that we structured Negan's story in season nine had a lot to do with what had come before in season eight. And then kind of our own goals within season nine of kind of showing these different sides of Negan and being true to the comic and his journey within the prison cell, but also like knowing that we wanted to get to certain places with him in season 10. So, um, you know, all of that said there, you know, there was pre-thought, but then really like once we got into the, the breaking of the season, which kind of happened in earnest in January, which is usually when our writer's room starts, that's when we started kind of like laying all the ideas out and, you know, spitballing, like what are, you know, what are the themes? What's the feeling and tone of things? 
How can we kind of get to these moments that we think that we want to get to? Then sometimes discovering that we want to go about it a completely different way. So it, it's just a process where there's multi layers, I guess. So now that we're so close to it, what are some of the themes? What are some of the feelings? What are, what are we getting into with season 10 as much as you're uh, as much as you <laughs> care to say at, at this early point when we when we get into the premiere itself? What do you think people are going to be feeling and, and what thematic ideas are you exploring? Yeah, I think one of the things that we kind of thought about early on and that I'd been thinking about is that, you know, we've done a series of wars on the show. We we did All Out War with the Saviors, and that was really, you know, it was an All Out War, and there was a lot of gun battles back and forth, and that was kind of the nature of the conflict with the Saviors and at that period of time. But because I'd kind of made this decision to jump a lot of time within the show, you know, I was like, okay, well, that changes what the nature of war is going to be in the timeline that we're in. So, we started thinking about that. I thought a lot about the things that Robert had set up in the comic. And I think one of the things that struck me the most was this idea of silence the whispers and the, the kind of propaganda and paranoia aspects that ran through it. And even the idea of a group that called themselves the whisperers, you know, like a whisper campaign, like, you know, that you think about in politics, there's something about it that's so insidious and kind of sneaky and underhanded that I thought was really interesting and that felt true to who this group was. You know, it's so brazen that Alpha walked through a festival just wearing a like a dead woman's scalp as a wig and, you know, a flowery dress. And then she murdered a bunch of people, you know, kind of like in plain sight, like she was like this, you know, like there was something about that that felt like, oh, she's like a spy that kind of like landed amongst our people and, and wreaked havoc. So we really started playing with this idea of things being more like a Cold War feel and because that's not something that we've really done on our show and found that there were just some really interesting avenues for us to explore by going down that route that were a little different than we'd played before, you know, because baked into the Whisperer story is this idea of the border, you know, this spiked border, you know, just thinking historically about all the kinds of border conflicts that have the people have gotten into that we we get into are in right now in our own country. But, you know, even in wars, what does it mean to own a piece of territory. And in some ways, like a border is this completely um, arbitrary designation that, that two sides have to agree on or not. And that just led to a lot of um, ideas about the types of stories we could tell with people who, you know, maybe feel like they're on the wrong side of the conflict or people who might want to escape from where they're at or, um, you know, people who may be trying to spread paranoia and fear. It kind of just led us down differing paths than we might have in past stories of, of battling each other that, that we found really fun to play with creatively and that I hope pay off for the audience when they watch the show because it, it's certainly been really interesting for us to kind of explore it in, uh, in this kind of framework as opposed to just like what are the coolest battles we can have. So several months have passed since the season nine finale in the context of the of the story of The Walking Dead. How has everything settled for Alexandria and, and the, the, you know, the allies within the Alexandrian safe zone? How has everything started to, to settle in for them after this really traumatic incident where so many of the people that they loved and knew were beheaded, their heads were established as part of that border wall? Um, specifically, how is this sitting with characters like Michonne and Daryl and Carol this year? What kinds of stories are are you hoping to tell with them after everything happened with with the heads at the border and the whispers kind of making their threat you know we thought it'd be interesting to jump time rather than picking up like right on the heels of that because it uh, allows us to show our people trying to move ahead and it, it tells us a lot about where their heads are at and what their mindset is and i think you know starting in on the season we really see they went about things in, in different ways. You know, I think Michonne very much is still like this general of the community. So 
across like the first few episodes, like you really see her kind of grappling with the paranoia that starts to grip everyone. She's very much thinking in terms of like big picture security ideas because the emotional response is like, let's just go, go across the border, kill them all. But, you know, she's really thinking about, like, what does that mean when somebody has tens of thousands of zombies and when Rick basically gave up his life, as far as she knows, on a bridge to to save a horde like that from running through the communities? Like, they know that zombies are still dangerous, especially when a group can control them. You know, we got to see Carol having made a completely different choice, which was to run away from it, you know, and try to forget it and try to move on. But it's really hard to move on from somebody having taken your son's head off. And so we've been really excited about playing kind of a a revenge narrative for Carol because, you know, I I think a lot of the heart of the series this season lies with Carol because she lost so much and there's still so much more that they could all lose. And and we're playing a lot in um, her perspective as um, this this grieving mother who just wants to, to settle the score between her and Alpha and the lengths that she'll go to to do that. But, you know, revenge is, revenge is a dark emotion and it leads her down some different paths. And I think Daryl finds himself in an interesting place. And I, I really love how, how Norman is playing it. You know, like he's kind of straddling that line between leadership and and the stuff that Michonne does and the stuff that, you know, Gabriel and Aaron and the people on the council are dealing with and also still just being like the guy who's used to being a lone wolf and having this really emotional tie of friendship and love for Carol where he, he feels like he's watching his friend go down some dark paths and, you know, he, he wants to be there for her and that kind of takes the story in some really interesting directions too, I hope. So I think what we really wanted to show is that for all of the leadership of Alexandria, they're in different places and, you know, they find themselves wishing that there was peace, but when there's not peace, there's really different ways to to deal with it and, and to move on. And they're not always in sync with each other. Obviously it's the walking dead. There are zombies. There's going to be action. There will be war, whether it is cold or hot, uh, but there will be love as well, at least to some degree <laughs> on this show from, from time to time. And I mean, I was at Comic-Con this year, so I was, I, I had a front row look at that trailer and was in that room when everybody exploded seeing Michonne and Ezekiel kiss, which is, you know, <laughs> this is, you know, draw, this is drawing from the source material. And I think got people pretty excited can you can you talk at all about that storyline and maybe just how how romance is going to be involved in season 10 of the walking dead and of course i am still very much the captain of the the daryl and connie ship so i'm (laughs) hoping that that is moving in a in a in a in a a forward (laughs) momentum direction anything that you can share on that front would be fantastic i oh my gosh well i don't here's the thing like i'm happy to share like little bits but i like the thing that i always try to do is like if I'm just watching as a fan of a show, like, how much do I want to know before it gets too deep into spoiler territory? And I just, I don't want to spoil, like, where the Michonne Ezekiel thing goes or, like, kind of what the context of that is. But it definitely, you know, the idea definitely came from a nod to the comic source material where, you know, Michonne and Ezekiel are the couple that was in the comics. And, um, you know, I think that there's, like, a really beautiful story that's that's involved there because I think you know here's there are people who are struggling and in pain and you know people who want connection and I think something that's important for me as we tell this story of of war is I think you know some of the it, what I find really interesting just about war stories in general is that a lot of times they are also the deepest and most beautiful love stories or like the love stories are interspersed there because you know, if you're fighting a war, you have to be fighting it for something or for someone or, you know, and I think whether the love is a romantic love or whether it's like the love of like country or friends or family or, you know, whatever, like you have to have that sense of like the people that you care deeply about because otherwise the war is meaningless. Otherwise the war is just, 
you know, it's just people like, you know, chest bumping and, you know, knocking spears and, you know, what does it mean? So, yeah, like there, there are definitely moments of warmth and romance and fun connections between people that are happening in the middle of this kind of bigger conflict that they're all wrapped up in. And, um, and there's some really great scenes between uh, Connie and Daryl. Won't say anything about where it goes, but, you know, th those two are great together. Also at Comic-Con, obviously, it was very emotional when Denai Guerrera announced that she would be leaving The Walking Dead this year, and this would be her last season playing Michonne. She has so many amazing things ahead of her in her future and things that she's already been involved in that are just, you know, absolutely terrific and the quality speaks for itself. I'd love to know, I know that, that you two have worked very closely together and what it has meant to, to you, what it means to The Walking Dead, both the, the community that creates the show and the community that engages in it, to lose Deny from uh, being a regular presence on the show and just the types of conversations that maybe you and the writers had or you and Deny even may have had in constructing a, a worthy ending uh, for this character that has been iconic for a decade plus for, for readers of the comics? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've been so fortunate to have somebody like Denai playing the role of Michonne because that character in the comics, is it's an iconic character in this other medium. And obviously we wanted her to be an iconic character in, in the TV show. And I think that Denai and her and just the the passion and the energy and the intelligence that she brought to the role all these years, you know, like that impact is has been incredible. And she's somebody that has been, you know, a great leader um, on set. You know, she's just a tireless athlete just threw her all into that aspect of it. And, you know, she's an amazing writer and storyteller in her own right. And so I think she's great in terms of being a collaborator with uh, when we're, we're talking about story. You know, like uh, we start off the seasons and, you know, I, as my showrunners before me did, like to have conversations with the actors and just kind of talk to them about where their characters' heads are at. And a lot of times those conversations um, end up informing the story or sometimes we'll say like here's what we're working on in the story and you know the the responses back kind of inform things too or inform the performance so there's that back and forth which has been really valuable i think you know for the fandom like uh, you know they they've embraced her just as we have um internally and i think you know for people who are fans of michonne i i really hope that we we give her a worthy exit. I, that's certainly been heavy on my mind ever since I knew that this would be her last season. We kind of knew for a bit it was coming. Um, you know, for people who follow any of the entertainment news, they might know that she has had her own show as a writer and showrunner picked up, which is amazing. And, you know, she's, she's an incredible writer. So I'm very excited for her to kind of open that chapter of her life in addition to all of her acting work. You know, we went at it with the same kind of seriousness that we treated um, Andy's exit last year. You know, it's like she her character has um, it has been so memorable. So I, I just hope we didn't screw it up. I, I don't know. Like, I never know till it's it's out there. But we know that we're just excited about the work that Denai did. I just think she's she's a powerhouse and a force of nature. And just the work that she does on screen is just is beautiful and really moving and powerful, I think, throughout. You've mentioned before that season nine, much of the work you were doing there with Jeffrey Dean Morgan as Negan was laying track for where you could go with him in season 10. And a lot of that for Jeffrey in season nine involved being on one set for a very, a very, very long <laughs> oh, yes. stretch of, of time, um, both in terms of, you know, the production of, of Walking Dead, but also in, in the universe, right? You know, the better part of a decade, Negan is in prison and I thought that the, it, it exhibited a really um, respectable amount of restraint that you kept Negan locked down in that way for so long not just in terms of a full season of the show but for so much of his life that I felt like it really buys you some goodwill to start maybe 
I don't know if redemption is too strong of a word for a guy who bashed Glenn's brains in, but to maybe start flirting with that a little bit more, or at least adding adding some different levels of, of humanity to him than we had seen previously. So with that work underway from season nine, can you talk a little bit about what you're excited about exploring with Negan in season 10? Safe to say he's not just in a cage all year. <laughs> it's safe to say he's not just in a cage all year. I think, you know... First of all, Negan is always Negan. And I think for me, that's a core principle of this character, which is that, you know, people change, but also in some ways, even when people change, they stay the same or maybe they become who they were always going to be or who they always were. I think there's a lot of aspects of Negan where I think his philosophy, if you really like, if you take away the fact that he bashed the heads of people that we really loved, you know, if you're just looking at it from the outside, there's things where you kind of go like, yeah, like, you know, his group was attacked by our people in the middle of the night and kind of slaughtered. So, you know, he had his own part of the story where he was like, wait a second, I'm the person who's the aggrieved party, whether or not we agree with his tactics in the aftermath. But I also think, you know, Negan has an edge, but Negan has aspects that are more relatable and redeemable. You know, I think that the way that he is with Judith, the way that he was with Carl, even though there's elements of it where you're like, oh man, like that's a very Negan way to go about things. You know, he was a, a like a school teacher or whatever before the apocalypse. And so there's an element of him that does care about like the next generation. So that's something that we'll kind of see at play. But at the same time, Negan, you know, his philosophy was a little, it's on this kind of selfish tip, I suppose. And so there's that aspect of him too. And he can never shut his mouth for better or for worse. And I think like what's been really fun is we get to see a lot of these different aspects. And I think Part of what was like really challenging to have Negan just kind of stuck in a cell. And I know Jeffrey was like, get me out of this cell. But at the same time, we got to see elements of his character that we hadn't really explored when he was Negan the leader. So seeing Negan hit rock bottom, I think, was really important so that we can kind of see where he goes from there, you know. But what I've really enjoyed this season and what I, I can't wait for people to see is just, you know, Negan being full Negan in very particular ways, I think is really fun. Jeffrey, I think is, I mean, he's hysterical. He has me like just dying of laughter when I see some of his scenes. So, you know, even that is just has been really enjoyable is seeing Negan be like just funny, funny Negan in places. It's really great. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, Jeffrey seems to be having a good time. So I hope people enjoy his work because I, I think he's just fantastic. You know, The Walking Dead obviously wrapped its comic book run this year. Robert brought it to a, a very surprising ending out of nowhere that this series that people had been so invested in for so long just kind of came to a very dramatic conclusion. For you, I would love to know what your reaction was to that, what you made of how the story played out. And even if you, you know, at that point allowed yourself to start considering what could an ending for the Walking Dead TV series look like? Uh, you know, this is a series that's going into its 10th season at this point. And for me, as somebody who's been tracking this story from really the very beginning or pretty close to it, I never really allowed myself to actually think that this story would end. You know, that was part of the premise baked into it was this is the zombie movie that doesn't end. We now know at the very least in terms of the comic books, it does eventually. And have you allowed yourself to start thinking that far down the line? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll start with just, I think, just appreciation for Robert and the fact that he told this one story for, I think it was 16 years or something like that. And I think the comic book is, is brilliant. I, I still am just a fan of the comics. I was a fan of it before I worked on the show, and I still am. And I think the fact that he ended it at a time when nobody expected it is also just kind of like peak Robert Kirkman writing The Walking Dead, because I feel like there's just something about that that's beautiful in that, you know, it's a story about life and death and the way that, like, 
death comes for all of us and it comes unexpectedly. And it's like the end of the comic book came unexpectedly because we were all like, what's he going to do for issue 200, you know? And I'd even been like, you're going to do something cool for 200, right? You want to tell me anything about it? Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, you know, and he had all kinds of ideas, but it's like it ended on his terms in its own time. And I think that that was right. And I think it's beautiful because he told the story that he set out to tell, which is ultimately, like, strangely, as dark as the comic can be, a, a very hopeful tale at the end, you know, that this this man who did everything kind of for his family and for his son, like, you know, like his son's family got to live on. Like, that's a beautiful story to me. You know, for the show, I think, yeah, like, I think we all think about, like, how do we kind of get to that end point? When does that happen? But also the, the funny thing is, like, Robert was like, after he finished it, he was like, yeah, yeah, you see what I did there? Like, look at all the, you could go down this path or this path or this path or this path for the story. So it's, I think that there's a lot of iterations that um, it could take for the story. And, you know, and it's that way by design. You know, Robert was done writing the comic, but that doesn't necessarily mean an end for the show in the same way that the comic ended, because that's not even necessarily what he intended. So it's just an interesting thing for us. All right. Well, before we wrap up, the premiere is going to be coming your way very soon, people. Angela, a tease. Anything out of context? Anything that we should be keeping an eye out for? What are we going to get specifically in this episode that we should be excited for? I what? Oh, my gosh. What am I excited? I'm excited for people to kind of see... You know, it's been teased in the, the trailers. There's people kind of doing a, some new styles of fighting on the beach. And I think I wanted for this premiere for there to be that sense of like our people kind of, you know, getting together and like figuring out what the next step is. And I think everybody that worked on this sequence from Greg, the director, to everybody in stunts and VFX and, you know, the art department and, you know, their beautiful work. They really put their all into to creating a sequence that looks unique and is really exciting and fun. Even the scoring is great. We have amazing our composer, Bear McCreary, and, you know, this year Sam Ewing, who works with him, is, is composing. So I'm excited for that. There's some really beautiful character work that Norman and Melissa do as Daryl and Carol that I think is, is fun. There's so many things that I love how it turned out in this episode, so... You know, and then there's some surprises. So hopefully the surprises will be good for people, too. Uh, you know, I don't know. I hope people find it fun and also, you know, in, enjoy the, the lovely character moments that our actors bring to it. Awesome. Angela, that's going to do it. That was great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Josh. I, I enjoyed speaking with you for like a longer chunk than we usually get to. So, yes. yeah, it was cool. No, it was great. <laughs> okay, Thank you again for you. taking the time. I really appreciate bye. it. All right. Take bye. care. Bye. That's going to do it for us this week on Series Regular, the Hollywood Reporter's all-in podcast on genre television. Coming next to Series Regular, another show debuting on October 6th, Mr. Robot, which airs the first of its final season episodes on October 6th at 10 p.m. on USA Network. I have a deep dive interview with creator Sam Esmail that you are not going to want to miss if you are a big Mr. Robot fan. And you are certainly going to want to make sure that you have seen the season premiere before you listen to that podcast because there are copious amounts of highly dangerous spoilers right away in that podcast. Be very, very careful before you listen to that one. Make sure you're subscribed to Series Regular on your podcast app of choice so that you never miss an episode. You can also email us, seriesregular at thr.com, with questions, feedback, show suggestions, all of that good stuff. You can tweet at me as well, at Round Howard on Twitter. Until next time, everybody, take care. 